We have uh, the honor to host in Amsterdam, virtually in Amsterdam, Professor Alex Edmonds, who is Professor of Finance at London's Business School and Academic Director of the Center of Corporate Governance, is uh, editor or associate editor of some of the top journals in finance, has spoken in the World Economic Forum, testified in the UK Parliament and gave a number of TED Talks, uh, and today he's here to present his latest book, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit, which has been named to the Financial Times Business Book of the Year. Uh, Professor Edmonds, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Alessio. Thank you to you and all your colleagues at Amsterdam for, for inviting me. And thank you to everybody for joining. There's a lot going on in the world. So I really appreciate you giving up an hour of your time to hear from me. So as Alessio says, I'm going to talk about the importance of responsible business. And interestingly, while responsibility was often something that, say, business ethics people will focus on, I, as a hard-hearted finance professor, have actually got interested in this topic. And why is this? What I'm hoping to convince you is that there's not just a moral case for a responsible business, but also a business case. And I think a good place to start is by giving you an example of what I mean by responsible business. And you might think, well, that's pretty obvious. Don't we know, know what responsibility involves? But actually, it's not obvious. So I'm going to start with an example. And so I'm going to take you on a journey outside of your home offices to halfway around the world. I'd like to take you to the Great Rift Valley. So this stretches across two continents and 6,000 kilometers from Lebanon in Asia to Mozambique in Africa. And it has some of the world's highest mountains, but also some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is this lake called Lake Magadi. It's in the Kenyan stretch of the Great Rift Valley. Now you might think it's hard to imagine that you're here because you haven't seen it before. But in fact, some of you might have seen it before, not on the small screen of your home laptop, but on the big screen of a movie theatre. It was featured in the blockbuster thriller, The Constant Gardener. And indeed, millions of people around the world have seen this lake because they've seen this movie, but fewer than a thousand people call the lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes his living selling and herding goats. Now, for Emmanuel, it used to be that cash was king. So it was cash that he get if he sold a goat. He then checked that cash in case it was forged. He'd store that cash and be worried about robbery. And to bank that cash, it wasn't just walking down the high street. He had to walk an entire day to get to the nearest bank. So his life was really tough. He couldn't graze his goats on the greenest pastures. He had to always be within one day of a bank. But all of that changed due to what I would call a responsible business. And that responsible business was Vodafone. So in 2012, Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. Let me just briefly explain what mobile money is, because we often think it's mobile banking. I have a bank account and I can operate it on my phone. I don't need to go to the branch. But that's in fact not what mobile money is, because for mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that was really important because 15 million Kenyan citizens had no access to banking at the time of this launch. So this transformed Emmanuel's life, right? He no longer needs to worry about robbery or forgery. He no longer needs to worry about walking an entire day to a bank. He can grace his goats wherever he wants to. And indeed for his accounting, He's got a record of every transaction because it's on his phone. And as academics, we know that we don't want to make a big thing out of just one example, but a large scale study by MIT Sloan economics professor Tavneet Suri found that within the first seven years of the launch of M-Pesa, 200,000 households got lifted out of poverty. And many of these households were headed up by women. It allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail. So that's one story I'm giving you about Vodafone. But now let me give you a, a quite different story. And this different story surrounds tax. 
because in 2012, Vodafone became the first telecoms company around the world to release a tax transparency report showing how much tax they are paying to governments worldwide. Now, that's obviously really important because in telecoms, you could choose to locate your licenses in low tax jurisdictions. So I've got two questions for the 50 plus people on this webinar to think about. One of these questions is which of these decisions, M-PESA or tax transparency, created most value for society? And the second is which of these decisions, if it had not been taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worse than Vodafone's corporate social responsibility, rating or reputation? Now, I'm not going to poll anybody here because I'm pretty sure that most people would agree with the answers. So which decision created most value for society? It was the first one. By launching M-PESA, they lifted 200,000 households out of poverty. But what would have been the backlash if they had not launched M-PESA? It would have been nothing. Right? You don't get slammed by the media for not launching an innovation you would have not got boycotted by customers for not coming out with this crazy idea of banking without a bank, because perhaps people never knew that this was ever a possibility. But what is the consequence of not being transparent on, on tax? It could be massive. And indeed, Vodafone had suffered a nationwide boycott of its stores two years earlier, because people thought they had legally, but not morally, avoided £6 billion of tax. So what is the message that I'm giving out of these first two stories? It's to try to shift our thinking on responsible business. We often think that it's about the answer to the second question. Like responsible businesses should do no harm. They should not cheat on taxes. They should not pollute the environment. They should not mistreat their workers. And don't get me wrong. Why well, absolutely responsibility involves doing none of those things. But you knew that before this webinar. There was no need for you to give up an hour of your time to help to hear me tell you this. Instead, I'd like to shift our thinking about responsibility to being about the answer to the first question. Right? It's about actively doing good. And why do I think that? Because I would say that in 2021, given the magnitude of the world's problems, it is not enough for a company just to do no bad. It must actively do good by doing some crazy ideas like banking without a bank, because that will actively create value to contributing towards solving some of society's deepest problems. And so that goes to the framework that I introduce in the book that Alessia mentions. We often view the value that a company creates as being given by a pie. And that pie can be split between investors in the form of profits and stakeholders or society in the form of value. And we often view responsibility as being about splitting the pie differently, right? So we should pay more tax than the legal minimum, pay higher wages than the minimum wage, and charge lower prices to customers than we can get away with. And absolutely, please don't get me wrong, that's all important. But I like to stress that viewing responsibility as just about splitting the pie differently is incomplete and it's inadequate for two reasons. So the first is if responsibility involves moving from here to here, then it makes the company less profitable, then CEOs won't voluntarily do this. Like, why would you do something that makes your company less profitable? And indeed, what we've seen is 181 CEOs signed the business roundtable new statement in August 2019, but many of them, when the rubber hit the road, they didn't put it into practice. And you might think, well, why would they? If it makes you less profitable, let's not do it. The second reason why responsibility can't just be about splitting the pie differently is that it's bad for investors. Now, many people think, I don't care, right? Politicians and the media like to portray investors as nameless, faceless capitalists. Investors are them. Society is us, and if we can take from them and give to us, then this is something which is going to create more value. It's going to be good. But I don't need to tell this audience that investors are not them. They are us. 
but they include parents saving for their children's education. They include pension funds saving for retirement. They might include the University of Amsterdam's endowment in order to fund future teaching and research. Right, so any repurposing of business absolutely needs to take investors seriously. So this is why my view of responsibility is that it's about growing the pie, actively creating value. So we do want to increase the orange, but the way we do that is not by giving society a greater share of what's already there, maybe donating to charity, but by relentlessly being committed to innovation and excellence, doing these crazy things like launching this idea of banking without a bank. And the beauty of that is that if we do this, then ultimately it's profitable. So when Vodafone launched M-Pesa, genuinely it was not to make money. Their strategy back then was to expand in the West and win Spectrum license auctions. They truly only created this thing because they thought that this would solve the social problem of financial inclusion. And then unexpectedly, they were able to benefit and the blue gold went up. So to sum up my first section, what do I mean by purpose? A purposeful business is one that creates profits only through creating value for society. And let me just pick apart this definition. So let me start with the final four words, creating value for society. You knew that. You didn't need to spend your time on this webinar to hear me tell you that. So it's the middle four words that I think are more important, create profits through creating value for society. Because it is important for companies to be profitable. Investors are a key element of society. But the important word here is the word only. Right? There are ways of creating profits by extracting from society, price gouging customers and cheating on taxes. But the word only says that we view creating value for society as the end goal and profits as a byproduct. We're driven by creating value. And if you do that, you will unexpectedly benefit and be able to monetize. So at this point in the talk, you might think, well, everything I said sounds great, but where's the evidence, right? It sounds too good to be true. Well, I'm sort of saying if companies create value for society, then magically profits are going to appear, but that sounds a bit like wishful thinking. So as academics, what we want to do is we want to look at evidence. Well, I've told you one story of Vodafone, but how do you know that I just didn't handpick that story because it, it's the one that works? And it's really important for evidence here to be rigorous because of this problem of confirmation bias, that people would will accept evidence if it confirms what people would like to be true, even if the evidence is flimsy. And that's a particular issue with responsible business, right? Because everybody wants it to be true that nice companies do better. So if there's even flimsy evidence suggesting that, people will latch onto it. And indeed, this was on my Twitter LinkedIn feed all last week, because as some of you might know, there was a new study published which claims that responsible investing always works. And let me just give a quote from a very, a very influential investor who I really respect. This is not to call anybody out, but just to highlight the issues. He wrote, is there anyone left on the planet who thinks that sustainable investing requires a sacrifice of return, right? So if you, if you, don't, if you think that, you're an alien, right? you're not even on this planet. If so, you might wanna send in this new study. And people were heralding the study, commenting on his thread, saying, oh, this study is compelling, a broad data set, thorough analysis. It's infallible facts. It is robust proof, right? But if you actually looked what it was doing, it was sort of a meta-analysis, taking a lot of underlying studies, which were unfortunately published in journals that many of us would have never heard of or not even published at all. And I listened to a podcast recently with a perhaps one of the most famous um, CEOs of um, responsibility, who was one who I truly respect. But he was asked the question by the podcast host, well, how do you overcome challenges? And he said, be passionate and positive and ignore cynics and skeptics. So people who argued that maybe we shouldn't get carried away with responsibility, maybe we should think about profit sometimes, 
he called them cynics and skeptics. When in fact, it's another word for cynicism or skepticism is diversity of opinion. And if in there indeed people are arguing, well, sometimes responsibility might not pay off, we should embrace this. And I think the approach of saying be passionate and positive and sort of ignore the evidence is not going to be the appropriate way of dealing with this. And so this is something I talked about recently in a, a TED talk called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World, about the importance of being really critical with the evidence, particularly if it's on something that we would like to be true. And so what I wanted to do is to look at it myself in, in my own research is, is it true that a company that serves society becomes profitable in the long term? Now, to do this, it's, it's really difficult because we need a way of trying to measure how profitable, how purposeful a company is. And you can't just look at a company's purpose statement because companies might say some nice things, but not actually put it into practice. So what I chose to do is I chose to look at how well a company treats its employees. And you might think, well, why do I look at employees? Because there's also the environment and taxpayers and customers. But I chose to look at employees because I had a very good measure available. And this was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America. So why is this list so good? Because it was available from 1984. And that's important because it meant I had tons of data. So this idea of ESG and responsibility is a pretty new phenomenon. So many data sets have only been around, let's say, for the last 10 years. And if I indeed showed that responsibility paid off from 2010 to 2019, you might think, well, those were 10 boom years for the stock market. Maybe responsibility only pays off in boom times. Right now in the pandemic, companies should focus on survival and not think about this. OK, so because my data started in 1984, I had the financial crisis. I had September 11th, I had the collapse of the internet bubble, so I could make sure that this was something which was not just a flash in the pan. And what I found was that the companies which are on this list, they delivered stock returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period, which is 89 to 184% cumulative. So this suggests that companies that are treating their work as well aren't just being fluffy companies who are splitting the pie differently, but are growing the pie, creating value, and investors are being better off. Now, also at this point, you should be skeptical because you might think, well, is this correlation or is this causation, right? You might think, well, maybe it's not employee satisfaction that causes a company to perform better. But if a company is already performing well, maybe its employees will be happy. Or maybe there's an omitted variable. Maybe a great CEO leads to her workers being happy. And this great CEO also means the company is going to perform well, but there's no direct link between the two. So what I did to try to address this, as I looked at the future um, earnings surprises of a company. So what is an earnings surprise? Well, every three months in the US, a company announces its quarterly earnings. And before it does that, analysts like Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley will forecast what the earnings are going to be. And if you do better than the forecast, right, that's what's known as an earnings surprise. And what's important is when these analysts are making those forecasts, they take into account the company's current profitability and expected future profitability. And they talk to management all the time. And so all of those things should be baked into the analyst's expectations. So if the companies do better, then what analysts are predicting, it must be sort of this hidden extra factor. And the one thing which is in common in all the companies in the portfolio was the fact that they were ranked as having high employee satisfaction. Now, what I've just done in the last study, that's still not perfect proof because I've just sort of assumed that analysts take into account management quality, but maybe analysts are sort of really dumb or something. So I think actually more convincing than my study on this is a study by Caroline Flammer of Boston University. So what she looked at was stakeholder proposals. So what is a stakeholder proposal? So we know that shareholders can make resolutions within companies. And sometimes these resolutions are just on profits, right, or, but, or dividends. 
but sometimes they could be about wider society. So here was a proposal in which they said, well, let's um, sort of sign be um, improve the company's human rights. Another proposal said we should make sure that companies, this company is not discriminating. Now, what this um, professor looked at was when you put in a shareholder proposal, then what happens to the future returns of the company? Now, if that was all she did, that would not be convincing. Why? The problem is, is that shareholder proposals to serve wider society, they don't appear randomly. Maybe it's a large engaged investor, let's say PGGM, which makes this proposal, and PBGGM more generally is going to monitor the company and improve performance. So it's nothing to do with the proposal. So instead, what Caroline does is something known as a regression discontinuity. She compares proposals that fail with, let's say, 49.8% of the votes to ones that just pass with 52.2% of the votes. And the idea here is if you just fail or just pass, that is random. That is not caused by a large investor because if PGGM was there, maybe they'd increase the support from 49% to 70%. Or something. And so what she found was that when companies pass these proposals, even though those proposals were there to help wider society, not to make money, actually the company does make more money, right? So the stock price and accounting performance goes up, there's greater labor productivity and there's higher sales growth. So my final section, and I'm going to be well less than 45 minutes to make sure there's going to be lots of time for questions. Is, well, how do we think about putting it into practice if you're a company or an investor? Now, what I'd like to get to is the elephant in the room, right? which is how to make decisions. Right? We know how to make decisions if shareholder value is the only objective. Right? Finance professors like me have been teaching this for the last 50 years. We take decisions by calculating net present value, that's the effect on shareholder value. But if a company's now have this additional objective, which is responsibility, well, they need something to supplement net present value. And now there are some advocates of responsible business who just say, take every investment, do the right thing, make sure that you cut your carbon emissions, make sure that you pay your workers healthcare. But that is unsatisfactory because companies do need to turn down certain investments Otherwise, they're not going to have any money left. So instead, what's important is to develop some principles to tell you when should you turn down an investment. And to guide this, I think it's important to go back to the word purposeful and to think about what does it actually mean for a company to be purposeful? Because often people view purpose as a synonym for altruism. They might say our purpose is to serve customers, workers, suppliers, environment, communities, and investors. Now, that sounds great, but the problem is that there are trade-offs. It's impossible to serve everybody. Right? If I'm an energy company and I close down a polluting plant, it's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers, and therefore I don't know how to make this particular trade-off. So instead, if we think about what does the word purposeful actually mean, it means focused and targeted. If I have a purposeful meeting, it's one with a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, I do it deliberately. And so a purposeful company is one that knows why it exists and the role it plays in the world. And the answer to that needs to be focused. So there's two things which are in the aspect of purpose, which I'm going to highlight. One is the why. Like, why do you exist? What do you do? And what I'm highlighting in the book is the principle of comparative advantage. So what do I mean by this? Right, there's loads of problems in the world that we might want to solve. And there's some companies who believe it's their responsibility to solve every problem. Right, let's claim we contribute to all 17 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Or when there's a climate change, when Extinction Rebellion has its... Um, demonstrations, let's make a big statement about that. When Mr. Floyd is killed, let's donate lots of money to Black Lives Matter and put a black square on our Instagram feed. We'll say something about every issue. When in fact, that is not the responsibility of a company. 
It's instead to focus on the issues that it has comparative advantage in solving because it's best place to solve them. So let me give an example of Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola has this program called Project Last Mile, and it makes vaccines available everywhere in Africa, including the difficult last mile to a rural school or a hospital. And so why does it do that rather than climate change or diversity? Well, because its expertise is in logistics. Right? It needs to make sure that Coke is available everywhere in Africa, including the difficult last mile to a rural school or hospital. So it's used that expertise to distribute vaccines because it's really good at distribution. Now, you might think, well, if it's good at distribution, why doesn't it distribute books? Because literacy is a challenge in Africa. But the thing with vaccines is they need to be transported cold. And Coca-Cola, being a drinks company, has expertise in refrigerated transportation. Let me contrast this with donating to charity. So when Mr. Floyd was killed, as I say, many companies just donated money to Black Lives Matter. And clearly I'm somebody who cares a lot about racial equality, but I don't think a company has comparative advantage in knowing what charity to support. Why did it choose Black Lives Matter? Why didn't it choose cancer research or animal rights or environment? Those are all other important charities. So if Alessia and I were both shareholders in a company, well, the comp it might be that I care about cancer research and Alessia cares about animal rights. And so if a company was to donate to one charity, maybe I would be happy, but Alessia would not be. So it's better for the company to pay out to us higher dividends or higher wages and then unless you and I could choose what charity to support, a company has no comparative advantage in making that choice. OK, so one question I'm often asked is, how do we know which companies are truly responsible and which are greenwashing? And I'd say it's based on this, right? The ones that are greenwashing are trying to do everything. They're doing an issue because it is in the media rather than because they are best placed to solve it. The second thing. I've talked about why you exist, going back to the second blue bullet, who it serves. So what I mean by this is if you go to the first bullet, there's lots of stakeholders we could care about, customers, the environment, and so on. But we can't serve everybody. Again, if you're trying closing a polluting plant, it's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers, so we can't help everyone. So the who, I'm going to talk about the principle of materiality. And so what I mean by this is that there are some stakeholders who are more material, they are more important to your company's business model than others. So what I'm going to do in terms of my final academic study is to show you the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. So what this does is it goes industry by industry and it highlights who were the most important stakeholders in that industry. So the first column minerals and extractives, the environment is clearly material. But what about if you're a bank, the second column? Your direct effect, at least, on the environment is not large. But what matters much more is social capital. Selling practices and product labelling, why right, if you're Wells Fargo and you've had a fake bank account scandal, that is really damaging for your business. And so what that means is that, yeah, we know climate change is the order of the day, and it's something I passionately care about. But if you're a bank, maybe it's even more important to make sure that you are absolutely first rate in terms of your selling practices and product labor. And so what this study does um, is it takes um, the ESG data from MSCI, which is perhaps the best known data set. And it looks at companies that do well on every issue. They do well across the board. And it finds that they outperform by 1.5% per year, which is insignificant. But when they redo this with a materiality lens and look at the companies that do well on the material issues, but they scale back on the immaterial ones, those do beat the market by 4.8% per year. This is really striking because what it suggests is that it's better to do well on only a few issues than to do well on every issue. Because you're trying to do well on every issue and you're trying to be all things to all people, 
then the person that you're probably forgetting about is shareholders and therefore you're not delivering your main responsibility, which is to deliver profits. And this is something which is striking because the way in which we try to evaluate companies is often through box ticking. Right? The more sustainable development goals we contribute to, the more boxes we tick, it seems better. When in fact, your responsibility of a company is not to solve every problem, but to highlight the one, the few issues that you do really well on. Just like if a person was to say, I'm serving on 20 non-profit boards, you might think, well, that person has probably a time management issue. It's better to serve on three. So my final section before the Q&A is to think about how do we apply this to the crisis? Because some people think now that we're in a pandemic, we're going to forget about responsibility. Companies can't afford it. So this is why I started my talk with highlighting how responsibility is about innovation. It's not about affording anything. It's not about giving money away. And that's important because in a pandemic, some companies don't have money to give. Now, a few companies do. And there are companies who've responded to the pandemic by giving money. So there's some CEOs who are being paid nothing. There's some companies who are paying their workers, even though the workers are furloughed. And there's some companies which are giving away lots of products. So Unilever is giving away 100 million euros of food and sanitizer. And that's fantastic. Right? All, co all companies that do that should be praised. But the problem is that not every company can split the pie differently because they don't have pie to give because it's a pandemic. But what if you don't have 100 million euros lying around? Or what if I'm not in the food and sanitizer industry and I don't have relevant products to give? So this is why I started my talk by viewing responsibility as a being about growing the pie, actively creating value rather than just redistributing it through throwing money at the problem. And so what I think a responsible CEO does is she asks herself, what is in my hand? What resources and what expertise does my company have? And how can I use this to serve society? And why this is so powerful is that it allows companies, even in unrelated industries, to play their part. So let's say um, Mercedes. Right? Formula One is not really useful in the pandemic. But what is in the hand is not just engineering expertise, but precision engineering. And with precision engineering, the same precision that you need to make a Formula One tur um, engine or piston is something that you need to make CPAP breathing machines, which are a less invasive alternative to ventilators. So you have a tremendous feat of engineering excellence, taking apart an existing machine, reverse engineering it, and making it something which was mass producible at scale. And so that's what they're doing in order to help out in this crisis. What about a large company, which is here? Let's take Qantas Airways in Australia. Now they would love to keep paying their workers who are furloughed, but they can't, like nobody's flying, they just don't have money. But what they do have in their hand is a relationship. And that relationship is with um, Woolworths. And Woolworths is a grocery store in Australia. It used to be that if you bought groceries at Woolworths, you, uh, you could get air miles and quantities. But they've leveraged that relationship so that if you're furloughed from Qantas, you can now get a job at Woolworths, and so you're preserving your employment and operating in the sector, which is in a lot of demand right now. Finally, what about a company, a small company, right? There's all the whole idea of donating 100 million. That sounds great, but if you're a small company, that's impossible. And often small companies think, oh, we don't care about responsibility. We just need to survive. Once we're worth a billion, we can start thinking about society. But actually, this is not the case if we think about responsibility as actively creating value. So let me give you an example of a small company that I'm an, um, a customer of. And this is um, a called Barry's Boot Camp. It's a brutal gym in London. So people like David Beckham go to it. It's around the world as well. And um, they're closed because of the lockdown. But what is in their hand is the ability to run fitness classes. And so what they did was they launched a lot of um, online um, classes free through Instagram, which is really important for people self-isolating at home. Now, you might think, well, that's not very innovative, right? a fitness company offering fitness classes. But what 
is in their hand. Well, but so what, what was really special was the following. So let's say you are a desk worker at the gym. You work at front desk and um, the gym is closed. So what can you do? Well, what it turns out is some of these desk workers are actors as their main job. And if you're an actor, what is in your hand is you're really funny. Now, you might think, well, why does that help out in the pandemic? Well, what we have is a lot of parents with their children at home because the schools are shut. And so what they're offering is free Zoom storytelling sessions to children. Now, this might seem a small thing, but it made a very big difference. Some of my friends have used it. When they have a difficult work call, they can have their children participate in these storytelling sessions. And so while that might be a small thing, right, it shows the power of viewing responsibility as using what is in your hand and how empowering this is. It's not just about throwing money at a problem. So obviously the pandemic is a really bad thing, but if there's any small silver lining to it, it's about how we should change our notion of responsibility from throwing money at a problem to creating value. And in my final slide, this also applies beyond just CEOs, right? I know that we've got a number of master's students here and you might think, well, everything I say, that's great once you're the CEO, that you can choose what your company does. Let's now make these breathing machines. But when you start out when you're really junior, can you do anything? Well, let me give you an example from my career. I started out at Morgan Stanley in investment banking. I was right at the bottom of the ladder. And you might think, well, nobody works for me. I'm just at the bottom. But I actually realized there were a lot of people who worked, did work for me. There was my secretary. There was the print room. There was the IT department. And the most abused department in an investment bank is called graphics. So what they do is you, you give them a, a PowerPoint markup, you scribble on it, you hand it to them, you ask them to implement it. They often don't do what you ask them to, and you shout at them, even though it was your fault because you didn't give them good instructions. So there were times that I got good work back from graphics, and I would call them up, and I'd say, hi, this is Alex. My job number is 81416. Who did my job? They say it was Juliet. I say, can you put me through to her? And they did. And I say, hi, Juliet, this is Alex. You just did my job. Um, I want to say it's really good. You did all these things well. I didn't even ask you to do this and you did it anyway. Now, honestly, I did not do this in order to sort of be saintly or goody goody. But because I was so junior, because I was so low down, I didn't have my own office. I sat in the open floor. And because of that, other people heard me doing that. Other analysts did. And they started to do it themselves. Now, I'm not going to claim I transformed the whole culture of Morgan Stanley. I clearly didn't. I only just probably affected a few people around me and maybe they affected a few others. But what this shows is the power of even like, individual citizens in a massive company to have a, a small change. Um, and, and so the, the, the phrase I often use is to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Right? A thermometer reflects the temperature around them. The thermostat affects the temperature. And even though we live in a world in which companies are getting ever bigger, and you might think as a citizen, you are powerless, this is something I think all of us can play a thermostat to a small degree. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I, I released this book uh, I, um, last year. And why I wanted to write this is I think for far too long, people have talked about responsibility as being something which is nice to have, it's fluffy, we do it for moral reasons, not realizing that there's actually a business case for it. But on the flip side, there's people who advocate responsibility, who forget about the idea that businesses still need to make money. And I wanted to balance this. Now, I've tried to base it on a lot of rigorous academic research. Now, often this research is, is written in academic journals and not for a practitioner audience. I wanted to bring it to life with some real world examples and case studies and frameworks. Also, I just taught, I taught it um, last May. And so if anybody's ever interested in teaching it, I've put some teaching slides available on the website in, in PDF. Obviously, if people want them, I can share the underlying PowerPoint. But I hope that that might be a resource for those of you who are students and want to res practice responsible business, but also those of you who are faculty who want to teach it or to get up to speed on the latest research. Okay, thank you very much for the latest for the attention. Um, I'm really happy to, to uh, uh, take questions now. Thanks very much, uh, Alex, for this inspiring talk and uh, look forward to your many, many questions. As I said, uh, please uh, just type question in the chat. I already see one question because I see a hand. Uh, 
but to make our life easier because we may miss a man just type down that you want to ask a question uh timo klein has already raised his hand and i managed to see it so please uh timo oh and another like to, no, we may not know each other all of us so please briefly introduce yourself before asking the question thanks Sure. Many, many thanks. Uh, very happy that you saw my hand, and many thanks for the for the really inspiring presentation. Very interesting to to hear this. Um, I'm a uh, or I, I recently graduated with a PhD in competition economics, and there's a bit of a tension from your story. And there are two interested parties. I think that you haven't really talked about. I'm interested to hear your views. One is the role of governments in solving social issues, and the second is the role of consumers or the effect on consumers. And specifically, I mean for governments. Um, what is the uh, lesson of your story for governments? Is it that we can trust government uh, 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 firms to solve social issues themselves? Or is it actually that solving these social issues is something that happens at the margin, even though many of the big social problems need radical change? So thinking about the role of, for instance, Shell or ExxonMobil in solving climate change, they're not going to reshape the entire business model to help solve climate change because it's clearly unprofitable or Unilever that is going to uh, get rid of all its virgin plastic um, and, and change it to recyclable plastic because that's not a clear business case for them. So what role do, does governments have in this in this um, in this story of yours? And secondly, um, the, the effect of consumers and then particularly what might be the effect of uh, market power here in this story where firms have a clear dominance in the market and they might be able to do more goods, but at the same time also raise prices at a detriment to consumers. So it might be good to society, but it hurts hurts consumers. Really thoughtful question, Timo. Th thanks so much for, for raising it. Um, so I cover this in, in, in chapter 10 of, of, of the book, and let me just highlight um, my thoughts now. You're absolutely right, I didn't cover it at all in my talk. So in terms of governments, I do think governments play a major role. So I have highlighted that there is a business case for many things. So there are things where I think companies should voluntarily want to do that, but that doesn't apply to all of these issues. Why? Because there's the issue of, of market failure. And so I think the main role of government is if there's a market failure to step in and address those market failures. And you've, you've already addressed two main sources of market failure. One of them is externalities. So these are things that don't affect the company even in the long term. So I talked about treating your workers well, and in the long term, those workers become more productive and, and, and motivated. And so it's in your company's interest to improve that. But with externalities such as carbon, that is not something that even in the long term, you as the individual company might um, be affected by. So when there are externalities and when they are measurable, I think they should be taxed or I think they should be directly regulated against. So um, the largest consortium of econom economists in history um, signed this letter, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, advocating a carbon tax. And, and this is something I'd be strongly supportive of because there is a clear market failure there. Second clear market failure is monopoly. And it's particularly interesting that you, you said this as a competition um, economist, um, is that the role of customers will be to hold companies to account for things that cannot be regulated. Why? Can something not be regulated if it's not easy to measure? So you can measure carbon emissions, but you can't measure a psychologically safe corporate culture. And it might be that customers might choose to walk away from companies that don't treat their work as well, for example. But, company, but customers can only walk away if there's other companies that they can walk to if there's competition and if there's monopoly power then you don't even have that option so i think another thing which i highlight in chapter 10 is the importance of competition law because without competition then we do have a market failure we have monopoly but i do think it's important to start with this idea of where should um what is the market failure because i think while i have a large role for government intervention it is only if there's market failure so let me give you an example of when there is not a market failure, at least I don't think. So in India, they have this law which forces every company to donate 2% of profits to CSR initiatives. And so there, actually, I think the government is uninformed compared to companies because companies know best where they should be allocating the money. So it might be if you're a growing company with a lot of investment opportunities, actually the best things that you should do 
is to develop new patents and products rather than to spend on CSR. Maybe for other companies, you should be spending 5% of your products from CSR, of your profits from CSR. So when there is a case of, of no market failure, those are things where the government, I don't think, should be involved. So the good framework to ask is, is there a market failure? Can the government address that? And the two things that you mentioned, Timo, are absolutely two things that I think the government should be stepping in. Uh, I have on the list uh, David Koch, who uh, wrote in the chat. Do you want to come forward or you prefer me to read uh, the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, can please I go ahead. Yeah, I am David. I work at uh, Royal Schiphol Group as an internal management consultant, and uh, I'm an uh, Amsterdam Business School alumnus. So thanks for the invitation. And I was wondering how the business reaction is on, um, on your. Uh, amazing message, both from the top level as from the workers level, because working in an organization that is trying to do right in a very tough situation, given the airline uh, industry and uh, transportation uh, current crisis, um, I see a discrepancy between what the top level wants and what the so to say, lower level employees feel like they can do, uh, as illustrated by your example. Thanks very much, David, for the question. So I think the business reaction that, that I've heard, and, and the problem here is it will be a selected reaction, is that I've, I, I've only heard sort of positive agreement with it. And, and like, I wish I could claim to you that nobody had thought about this idea before. And then when they read the book, they said, oh, yeah, this has transformed my view or that we should create some shared value. Instead, it, it was that people thought that this was the way to run business, but then without sort of the frameworks and the evidence behind it. So it was sort of moving with the direction. I think the main problem that I have suffered is not so much abs presence of, of headwinds, but lack of tailwinds, is because the book is balanced, it doesn't have sort of the one-sided partisan support behind it. So if I was to say businesses are evil, they should ignore profit, they should just serve society, then clearly there would be some sort of um, people behind that message. And if I said, well, profit is so important because it funds endowments and investors and we should only focus on profit, there'd be other people who'd be back behind that. So I, so I don't, I've not had people sort of get that overly excited about it as the same way in that something more partisan would be. In terms of your specific question on, on CEOs and workers, um, I, I think the idea that CEOs and workers are in it together in many things is, is positive. Um, one of the questions I often get asked is, well, how does a company actually put purpose into practice? And I think the important thing is it's not a CEO thinks about purpose herself and then tells employees how to implement it but employees should be used as part of purpose formulation. So there's many examples I give in particular in chapter eight, where there were uh, so many innovations which came out through um, actually employees coming up with these ideas, not with, um, not with companies. One example is actually Vodafone, right? At the time, as I mentioned, they were trying to win spectrum license auctions, but it was one of their small departments which realized what potential their technology had to solve unrelated problems. And indeed, that was so successful, the Zempezer initiative, that it completely changed even the purpose of Vodafone. It is now to use our digital technology to enhance socioeconomic progress. And there's nothing about that which says the progress needs to be limited towards making phone calls and sending text messages. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Uh, next is Pushpika. Vishvanathan, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Please introduce yourself before. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you, Alessio. Thank you, Alex, for a very interesting talk. Um, I am an uh, assistant professor at the Amsterdam Business School, and my research area is uh, corporate social responsibility and corporate governance. And um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I feel like this discussion, this discourse about corporate purposes is, is relatively new. But in your talk, I also you know, heard you cite work by Caroline Flemmer, who did, is more of a CSR researcher, also George Seraphim does CSR. So how do you see these things to be different? How is corporate social responsibility different from corporate purpose? And maybe also other related concepts such as uh, sustainability, stakeholder theory. How do you, what's the novelty here 
Yeah, thanks for thanks very much for the question, Krishmika. So th there's a lot of relation between them, which is about the importance of serving wider society. I'd say there's a couple of things in which I would view purpose and pie growing as being different. So one of them is um, about core versus ancillary so corporate social responsibilities activities that you can do to serve wider society but it could well be that even a tobacco company will do um corporate social responsibility it could choose to donate to charities whereas purpose is about is the main way in which you serve society one which is also so is the main way in which you're generating profits one which is also serving society so as a professor right i think the main way that i serve society is not the fact that i bike to my lectures rather than taking the uber it's the fact that in my lectures i might choose to work really hard on making them modern and applicable even though sort of teaching is not explicitly rewarded so that's a core activity for me as a professor rather than my method of, of transport i think the second thing is the importance of do no harm versus actively do good so csr is, is, is often looked at look at these csr measures let's try to make sure that there's no workplace injuries and there's not unfair taxes again that's important but this actively do good this innovation thing like vodafone and pesa that's something which is not captured in a lot of the work even by carolina flammer and, and george seraphine people I, I greatly respect just because it's not being considered as part of csr uh, thanks. I, and now I have a, a question from uh, Professor Ma Maria Bartol, uh, Professor of Private Law of the, uh, at the Amsterdam Center of Transformative Private Law. Well, unfortunately, I cannot ask a question herself, but I'll try to, uh, to, to, to read it. Making a, a small introduction, I promised Alex uh, a lot of feedback from uh, the law school, and uh, I think it's, it's particularly provoking to read out loud one, one sentence that you have written in, on page two of your book. Uh, stresses that the legal regime doesn't matter for the trade-off. Now, uh, why I say this is an introduction? Because the question of my colleague, Maria Bartle, is uh, how do you, do you see the role of government in innovation, and in particular in addressing the difficulties of uh, the, the market failure uh, related with the, the, the climate changes and similar crisis of the environment? Okay. Um, the government and innovation. I think there is this is all government and the law. Government and okay. the law, also private law. Yeah. Okay, so so let me start with the government question first. Thank you, Maria, for your question. Um, this is another positive role for the government. So, um, in my answer to Timo's early question, I mentioned competition. I, I mentioned competition and externalities. But actually, in chapter ten of the book, I have sort of about eight different ways in which I think the government can play a role. And innovation is absolutely one of them. Is I think with innovation, it, there are often public-private partnerships. So with this Vodafone and Mpesa thing, it actually she wasn't just Vodafone alone that did it. They did it in conjunction with DFID, which is the UK Department for International Development. And so that's the idea of the example that the entrepreneurial state that actually the government can be involved in innovation as, as well. Part of it might be with the departments like DFID. And part of it is government can be, do things to try to fund um, small businesses. So small businesses are typically very innovative. If we think as economists, what's the problem of small businesses? Information asymmetry. It makes it very difficult for small businesses to raise capital. So there's particular programs that governments might have to try to fund small businesses. So in the UK, we have the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme. In France, I think it's called the Madeleine Provision. In Germany, there's a um, scheme called invest all ways in which we try to make sure that small businesses can get finance and governments can play a role in that in addition to directly being involved themselves um, and indeed sort of the role of, of, of law again going back to externalities that can be measured right they should be either be taxed or directly outlawed because a market failure will mean that companies might not take these directly into account. So there might be just certain things that you're not allowed to do, such as modern slavery. And so the government should just ban that. That's the best way of dealing with some of these measurable issues. Thanks, Alex. Uh, there's a lot of questions in the, in, the, in the pipeline. So I'll start taking two by two. So I, I have in my list, Tomislav Ladika and then Sander. Please, uh, can you, I hope you don't mind that we take two questions and though you can. Thanks. Yeah, it's fine. 
Okay, hi Alex. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I so you you stated that the purpose of companies one that creates profits only through creating value for society. I'm wondering how would how do you propose to identify what value for society is? I think in finance until at least recently that the predominant view was that anything that creates shareholder value also is valuable for society. But I think all of us could think of examples of something that create increase the stock price but actually harm society. So that's one question. And then just a quick follow-up. Uh, how does your framework view companies that do good for some elements of society, but harm for others? So just to give one example, uh, Amazon is a company that is really focused on you know, its comparative advantage of uh, improving the customer experience. And they do a lot of innovative things with logistics that have really done remarkable things for customers. But there's a lot of recent press that, you know, the, the flip side of that is uh, they exploit their warehouse workers. So I wonder how you take, like, that's just one example, companies that have, like, you know, two sides to what they're doing and how that fits into your framework. Thanks, Thomas. And then do I go to, shall we take Sanders now or shall I answer that? Because that was already. Uh, yeah, Sanders, please. My, go ahead. My yes. question is closely related. I, I, I was actually looking at a, a similar problem, like with fi purely financial gains, we know what the, the optimal rule is in theory. You pick the NPV positive uh, proposals or the highest NPV proposal. None. Then if you look at the comparison here, there are several dimensions. And as Thomas off says, you're going to have to compare them. Your materiality mapping is, is perhaps a step, or the, the materiality mapping you show is perhaps a step in the direction. But I'm, I'm an assistant professor at the accounting department. I can tell you that even within accounting, the definition of materiality is not particularly well uh, described. And that's when we're dealing with financial issues. So if we're going to make a comparison, uh, similarly with the externalities, anything that's measurable and priceable, we might be able to compare. But beyond that, is there any way that we can actually make this trade-off between one ethical norm and the other, or one added value and the other, if they are not clearly delineated in a common monetary unit, like with the financial project, like financial projects more or less are? Okay, these are these these are two two great questions. So so um, so let's start with the first of of, of Tamislav's questions. What is value for society so it has to be something beyond profit so i see profits as a, as a byproduct of serving society so are you creating value for societies are we contributing to some social needs so if this was something which we ignore the profits that it creates is this a good which is is positive so i would say that that is not satisfied for tobacco however controversially i would say it is satisfied for alcohol so one of my other hats is I serve on the Responsible Investment Advisory Committee for Royal London Asset Management, and we, we have a policy we will never invest in tobacco, but we might invest in alcohol if you are best in class. So how can we justify that? Because um, we would ask ourselves, would the world be better off if there was no alcohol, if there was prohibition? And the answer, I think, is, is, is no. Um, I think particularly in a world in which there's much more fragmentation, alcohol can be a social lubricant. It encourages people to have um, more interactions. Those of us who go to academic conferences after a whole day of sitting through papers, right, the evenings are much better if, if, if we have that and actually that's why we are much more positive on alcohol than say chocolate companies even though that's sort of fun because there's a social element to this now clearly there's no clear objective way to say what um, is value created for society but that's some of the examples of of, of what we're thinking about is there something which does uh, address some social issues second question of of um tom um thomas Lav was what happens if a company does well for some but harms others. And actually, at Royal London, we used to own Amazon, and it was our most controversial um, holding. So how do we think about this? Well, certainly, there was a lot of negative press on Amazon. So our first thing, as sort of we try to base these things on evidence, is investigate these issues. So are they as serious as everybody says? And yeah, there were some. Uh, there was a really damaging, I think, LinkedIn article um, or New York Times article on, on Amazon when actually people who then responded, so it was on New York Times, and people responded on, on, on LinkedIn and said, a lot of these things are actually not, not true at all. And even though, yes, there are some poor treatment of workers, if you look at the workforce as a whole, 
in terms of um, a LinkedIn, I think, rated Amazon the number one workplace, or it certainly was in the top 10 the last three years. What we try to do is a net benefit test, and we think about all of the positives that a company does, making products available to customers worldwide, and then we try to look at the negatives. Is the positive going to be outweighing the negatives? Now, clearly, there's a subjectivity to this, and this was behind Sanders' question. There's no clear weighting scheme to take the um, negative effect on some employees with the positive effect on, um, on um, customers. But I think overall, we will have some subjective weighting. Just like even if you forgot about ESG and you invested, you tried to evaluate a company for investment based on purely financial criteria, you would have to weight financials, management quality, competitive positioning, future outlook, industry dynamics. There's no formulaic weighting scheme, but we can still in our heads make that judgment. And so that's what we did with um, Amazon. So clearly there's subjectivity because different people might place different weights, but I like this subjectivity because even if there was a clear weighting scheme, then everybody would agree with it and it would be priced into the market. So the fact that we don't have unambiguous ESG ratings or unambiguous ways to raise these trade-offs, I think that this is actually positive because it means that it's likely that the um, market doesn't get it right. And so those of us who consider the positives, even though it's very easy to shame Amazon based on the negatives, we might be able to invest in some companies and create value that others won't. Great. Uh, uh, two more questions. Uh, one from Benedict. Burdak and this next one from Kinaya Pyle. So please ask uh, your questions. And again, we do two, two questions at one time. Yeah. First of all, Professor Edmonds, thank you for your interesting lecture. I just wanted to ask what your stance is on uh, redistributive action. So do you believe growing the pie and redistribu redistributing the pie are mutually exclusive? Or do you believe there are certain issues which are best addressed by redistributing the pie and not only growing it? Thanks very much for the question, Benedict. I think with issues like pay ratios uh, or anything, issues more generally, as an academic, I like to answer it by looking at evidence. And um, what's interesting with pay ratios is that the evidence in this um, has been quite misportrayed by um, many pressure groups. So um, a few years ago, I was um, testifying in um, Parliament in the UK, there was a corporate governance inquiry, and the witness before me was a trade union, and the trade union claimed that the evidence finds that pay ratios are negatively correlated with performance. So the higher the pay ratio, the worse the performance, because this is a sign of demotivation of employees. And so that would suggest that actually a better distribution also creates more value, because if there's more equality, people are more productive. Now, in fact, what the trade union did was it quoted a half finished study. Now, the finished version was actually already out. It was out three years before this inquiry. And the finished version found completely the opposite results. So what the trade union had done is they selectively quoted a draft of a paper because it had the results that it wanted. And this paper here is based on US data, but work by um, Holger Muller, um, Elena Siminci and Paige Rime finds the same thing for the UK. Um, work by Ingolf Dittmann and his co-authors finds the same in Germany, even though there's quite different social norms. So the pay ratio, I think the problem with that is that it sort of assumes this fixed pie. It's the idea that if the CEO was is paid too much compared to her colleagues, it's at the expense of them. When actually, there could be cases in which everybody benefits, there's a parade of improvement, but actually the ratio gets worse. So let's say I am a worker, I'm paid 50,000 euros, and let's say um, Alessio is the CEO, he's paid a million euros. Now, the company does well, Alessio goes from 1 million to 1.2 million, and I go from 50 to 58, right? The pay ratio actually gets worse, it gets high, goes higher, even though everybody's better off. And actually, Alessio's pay should be more tied to performance than mine, because he as the CEO has more of an effect. So I think what's relevant is not so much the ratio, but sort of the um, the absolute standards that we're, we're, we're giving to workers. So they absolutely need, need to be treated well, right? But that should be the case irrespective of the CEO's performance, right? So the CEO's pay 
will depend on how well she's performed and so on. And if she's performed well, I don't begrudge her her high pay. And if she's poor, performed poorly and her pay goes down, there should no, the, the ratio should not be kept constant because that would involve worker pay going down. I think workers should always be given um, a decent wage and a, different, a decent standard of living, irrespective of the CA performance. So I actually don't think um, the ratio should be an issue. Now, if you are concerned about inequality per se, there are ways of addressing inequality, but they should be done at the government level through higher taxes. Why? Because if indeed there's inequality, it's not just something which CEO pay contributes to, but any scalable profession contributes to, right? Jane Austen is not clearly more talented than J.K. Rowling, but J.K. Rowling makes far more money because her, her books can be sold worldwide and made into movies. Same with footballers, uh, same with, with reality TV stars and so on. So I think if we're concerned about inequality, it's the government who should step in. And so then in addition to the questions that we had earlier on the entrepreneurial state and Timo's question about competition and externalities, the other role for government is redistribution. But if that was to happen, it should happen across all highly paid professions, not just CEOs. Thanks. Kinayana, <clears throat> sorry, please. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for this interesting presentation. So I wrote a question in the chat, but I'd like to expand on it a little bit. So I wrote, I wrote what do you consider to be the source or the, of this duty or responsibility to use your expertise to serve society as a company? Um, but the question stems from not fully understanding where your thinking fits in into the debate on, let's say, the one hand, share, shareholder theory, stakeholder theory, social purpose, corporate purpose thinking. Um, because, like, let's say, Friedman, the, the business of business is business. Um, that thinking entails that there's an, only an indirect responsibility by, by being profitable indirectly, you serve society and regulation and tax are there to redistribute. And then stakeholder theory is you have a direct responsibility towards your direct stakeholders. Um, and there's a, like a normative foundation or a theory behind why you owe that to your stakeholders. So I'm curious what's behind, like theoretically behind this, this responsibility to um, use your expertise to serve like the wider society. Love this question. I love that there's a thinking behind it, right? Because you might think, well, why should they use their expertise to serve society? Shouldn't they just use their expertise to serve shareholders? Because that's the um, who they're responsible for. So I, my answer to this would be in two ways. So first, even if your responsibility was to only to be concerned with shareholders, it might be that shareholders are concerned with society. So some of you will know this Hart and Zingala's idea that actually shareholder welfare is more than just shareholder value. So why do I invest my money? It's not just to give me a higher income in retirement, it's to give me a higher standard of living in retirement. And my standard of living will depend on the temperature of the planet um, rather than just um, the um, income that I have. So if a company has a comparative advantage in reducing its carbon impact, I as a shareholder would prefer that company to do that rather than the company to make more money, give it to me, and then I could donate my money to Greenpeace why? Because if the company has its comparative advantage, it can achieve far more in terms of reducing its environmental impact than I could by giving money to charity. So while I actually think the Friedman article is much more nuanced and, and much more broad minded than people give it credit for, what he assumes away in his framework is he does, he assumes completely away comparative advantage. My second answer to the, your question is that even if shareholders only cared about money, and nothing else, there could well be a lot of motivational benefits in terms of companies serving wider society, in terms of attracting employees and customers. So one example is, is, is Merck, um, in which I mentioned in chapter one of the book, and they chose to give away ivermectin, this cure for river blindness um, to governments in Africa because they couldn't afford it. And, and so why did they do that? Well, as a result of that, there were a lot of employees who joined them even though they weren't offering the highest pay because they just wanted to be part of a company that serves wider society. And if you take, say, the Mercedes engineers, they might otherwise be sort of bored at this time, but they were able to keep motivated in the pandemic because they were able to use their expertise to work on a social problem. So even if you think that something, you're using your expertise 
only to serve society in terms of the direct thing, actually there's going to be indirect benefits in terms of employee engagement and customer retention, and that will ultimately benefit shareholders. Uh, uh, thanks so much. I, I'd like to briefly abuse my role as, as chair of this meeting because I'm so excited about this. I want to ask you a question, Alex. So, so I found really fascinating that you try to, to, to describe a system of, of, of companies' decision making to address the problem of society. Uh, but I wonder whether, uh, again, coming back to the law matters quest, question, there's, there's another dimension which law matters, and that is namely the, 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 the the allocation of residual control rights. So you, you, you said, and I think it's really fascinating that companies have comparative advantage to relative to government when the damage to society or the benefit to society is not really measurable, but then who decides there is, is those who have control rights uh, and can affect the decision-making of, 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 of companies. And that varies depending on the law. So what is your take on that? Um, so what? So uh, uh, sorry, can we, I, I got most of the question, but not not that last part. Can you just re rephrase that? Last so part? so the, the distribution of counter yeah. rights mm -hmm. in corporate governance mm -hmm. varies across jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. so yeah, sometimes so, so, shareholders have more power. Yes. Sometimes managers have more power, right. and, 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 and because someone has to make decisions on something is not well measurable. I mean, this mm -hmm. is like what, what you said several times. Uh, in some jurisdiction that may be easier than in others, or maybe there's an optimal design of, of, of rules uh, given control rights. Yes, so, so as I see it, it should be either shareholders or managers on behalf of shareholders who make these residual decisions. So why is that not stakeholders, even though I do care about stakeholders, is that stakeholders can be protected by contracts, right? So with, with um, an employee, you have an employment contract with customers, you have a contract and with and so forth. So that's why the contract can, can protect you. Whereas with shareholders, you're the residual claimant. You get what's left over after everybody have um, ha, ha, has taken their, their, their slice of everything. So it should be that I think if a company is to pursue something other, then explicit shareholder value maximization. It should be shareholders who um, come up with this and give management the, the, the um, green light to do this. One of the problems that we have is sometimes managers will do things just to benefit themselves. So we have this big debate about shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. And the argument is if we reduce the power of shareholders, stakeholders are going to be better off. When in fact, the thing we need to be concerned about is managerial capitalism. Sometimes managers can just pursue things for their own benefit, which shrinks the buy and hurts both. So there's a nice paper in the Review of Financial Studies last year, which looks at companies that donate to charity, which, as we've discussed, doesn't use comparative advantage. And why do they do that? Because the CEO donates to charities, which are affiliated with the board of directors, and then the CEO gets paid more as a result, particularly if the directors were on the remuneration committee. So actually, I do think it's really important to have shareholder accountability. What was disappointing was out of all the people who signed the business roundtable statement, only 2% of them um, put, put it past their board. And that's a problem because you would think that the board is sort of the representative of shareholders. What I'm putting in, in the chat um, now is an article that I, I wrote in the Wall Street Journal last year on say on purpose. So what's the idea of this is that um, companies have a say on pay in most countries. The say on purpose is if a company would like to have a um, objectives other than shareholder value. It might be that 